moving forward. Um, our keynote speaker for today's program is uh, uh, Ajmal Masood. Um, he is a very busy person. I think I, it took me six months to get his time uh, to come uh, for our masjid and uh, speak to our namazis and salis. So this is one of the best time, Alhamdulillah. It's the uh, month of Rabi al -Awwal. And um, this, is, this is where you know we would like to speak uh, about the seerah of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I would like to request Brother Ajman Masu uh, to speak to us. Jazakallah. Yes. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim. Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah Nahmaduhu wa Nasta'inuhu wa Nasta'gfiruhu. ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا حبيبنا محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا الى الله باذنه وسراجا منيرا اما بعد my brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته it's a great pleasure and honor to be here um, to be here for many reasons. I miss this mosque. Um, did I have? Uh, I began my life's uh, job as an imam from this masjid, from here, this very pulpit in 1991, 92. Those days when this masjid was just starting up. So it's a pleasure to come back. And to stand here and to speak to you all it reminds me of my life here. I used to live next door, next road, Selsdon Road. I lived there for a long time. I can see Rana Saab here. Nice to see you. I can see many other uncles, elders who I have known for years and you've seen me for years. So don't worry, it's not the busyness that I've had that has kept me away, but my heart has always been here. Um, when Rabi Ul Awal comes, we all become very much fond of our beloved Prophet Muhammad <laughs> Suddenly we wake up. Oh, Prophet Muhammad was born on this month. We must do something. There are people who do all sorts of things in the name of the life of the Prophet in celebration of his life. From strange to weird, some even do things that have nothing to do with Islam. For example, cutting cakes on his birthday. Wallahi, I've never come across such an ajib practice in my life. Now, look, I can turn a blind eye to you cutting cakes on your wedding days. I can. I can turn a blind eye to you cutting cakes on your own birthdays, no problem, or your children's. But cutting cake on the birthday of the Prophet of Allah وسلم, must have some value, must have some connection, right? Prophet وسلم, should have done it himself. But he didn't. So, this idea that we can get away by doing anything we like in his name, just because he was born on this day, I'll challenge you that you can't. Allah will ask you on the Day of Judgment. Actually, is this the true manifestation of the love that you had for Muhammad Is this the love that you had for my Prophet? Some people do processions, walk up and down high street with flags. People do all sorts of things. But the best way to celebrate his birthday, my brothers and sisters, is to celebrate it every day. Best way to celebrate his birthday is to live his teachings every day. Allah says in the Quran, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ And in you, O Muhammad, we have created supreme example. خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ The best example of character. Prophet ﷺ said in his speech, إِنِّي بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ Allah has sent me to perfect the character of people. Prophet is like a polished cloth. You know when you go to 
those who know diamond, you know that when you pick diamond from the wild, from the wherever they are found, they are very rough stones. They don't look shiny. In fact, you may not even know it's a diamond unless you're trained. When you pick it up, and if it's diamond, you polish it with a polished cloth until it shines. You cut it until it looks like diamond. In the nature, the glittery, the shiny, the beautiful shape of a diamond doesn't exist. Human beings polish it. Prophet ﷺ is like that polished cloth. Allah sent him to us as his prophet to polish our character by the examples he laid out. <clears throat> now brothers and sisters, who better can tell us about his example than his own wife? When a group of companions came to the Prophet of Allah's wife after the Prophet had died, and they said, Oh Prophet, oh Aisha, please tell us about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa She said, do you not read the Quran? They said, how is that an answer? We are asking you to tell us about the Prophet. Why are you saying we don't read the Quran? Of course we read the Quran. Prophet's wife Aisha said, he was the living manifestation of the Quran. Allahu Akbar. If you want to see Quran walking, Quran living, you look at the life of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We Muslims have become jalebi eating, galabiya wearing Muslims today. <coughs> Are you listening? We love our jalebis when the birthday of the Prophet comes and we say that's the sunnah. We wear long dresses, mashallah, looking beautiful. We think that's the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Somebody a few days ago stopped me in the mosque and uh, in a shop really. And he said to me, I, I, I was growing my hair very long. I didn't have the time to cut it actually. But anyway, until the day before yesterday, it was very long. So he stopped me in the shop and he said to me, Oh, are you growing the, the, the hair of the Prophet sunnah? Is it the sunnah uh, hair? I said to him, what do you mean is it the sunnah hair? Because the long, you know, the long one. So I said to him, can I ask you a question? Sure. Was the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam born with long hair? He said, no. What was he born with? <coughs> Ordinary hair. Short, slightly long maybe, no longer than an inch, a couple of inches, as every child. If the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is what he did, what he said, what he approved, then when he had short hair, that's the sunnah. When he shaved his hair, that's the sunnah. Every millimeter of his hair, as it grew, he had it on his head. Therefore, it's the sunnah. Why are you limiting sunnah to long hair, the bob hair that we see prevalent in the Asian subcontinent? Why? He goes, oh, I never thought of that. We don't use our brain when it comes to following the Prophet of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We are blinded by our emotion. And we don't really study thoroughly from the seer of our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to truly understand what he was like and how he was. Let me read to you a beautiful saying of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib was one of the earliest Muslims. Amongst the first four people who became Muslim, the first one, who was the first one to become Muslim in, his, in Prophet's life? Anyone knows? Amongst, the, amongst his family, Khadija radiallahu anha, his wife. Who was amongst the older people who became Muslim first? Abu Bakr radiallahu anha. Who was the third to become Muslim? Amongst the free people, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Somebody said, actually the third was Zayd, because Zayd was Prophet's companion even before. Amongst the earliest four people, Ali ibn Abi Talib was Prophet's close companion, son in law, cousin, and the fourth Khalif of Islam. He said, and I'm not quoting him, I took his statement and I wrote it in my own so that you can understand. This is what it reads O oh, Prophet of Allah, you are of cheerful disposition. Always bright and radiant. You were tender hearted, sweet tempered, not stern by nature, but always lenient. 
Rosh HaSalam was always happy. Anytime somebody came to see him, his face was always cheerful. Unless something has happened for which he needed to express a particular expression, otherwise he was always cheerful. Some Muslims think the more stern you look, the more pious you become. Are you familiar with this idea? If you look very hard and solid, your most pious person. Apparently, pious people don't smile. <laughs> La ilaha illallah. Where do you get that from? Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to always smile. Always smile. His smile was radiant and it would be infectious. It would melt the heart of those people who even hated him. Always cheerful. Always bright and radiant. His face was always bright and radiant. He was tender hearted, sweet tempered. Not stern by nature, but always lenient. Allah says in the Quran, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِدَّ لَهُمْ Remember that verse of the Quran? Allah says, if it wasn't for you, who is lenient towards his people, and had you been harsh-hearted, people would have run away from you. Not only, you, not only are you soft-hearted, but you forgive people when they make mistakes. You ask Allah to forgive them, and you still consult them in everything that they do. Subhanallah. In battle of Uhud, when Prophet ﷺ was left on his own in the middle of the battlefield to be wounded, attacked from left, right and center, except a few very close companions who protected him, including female companions who stood there taking the hit. Prophet ﷺ was injured, his head was cut, he lost his tooth. At that time, many companions left the battlefield. What did they do? They left the battlefield. When you leave the battlefield, what have you done? There's an English word for it. If you leave the, leave the battlefield, you have committed treason. But there is something else. There is an English word for it. You walk away from the battlefield. Huh? No, you don't know? When you leave the battlefield, you have done something very... It's a grave... You would be court-martialed instantly. And you could even be executed for putting your army in danger. Prophet ﷺ was left injured. The companions did not only leave him injured, they dropped their swords and they were walking around like zombies because the news went around that Prophet ﷺ has been killed. After all of that, his uncle was killed, Hamza. Oh, not only killed, cut to pieces. After all of that, 70 or more companions died in that battle. Even after all of that. Allah says, O oh Muhammad, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِدَّ لَهُمْ If it wasn't for your kind-heartedness, if it wasn't for your kind-heartedness, people would have run away from you. All these people who did all these things against you while you were in the middle of the battlefield, you forgave them. And you ask Allah to forgive them. And you still consult them in their affair. My brothers and sisters, this is Prophet of Allah Wasallam. Let me ask you this question. If somebody lets you down, is it easy for you to forgive them? Nah. It's very difficult. If somebody hurts you, you hold on to the grudge in your heart for years to come. I met somebody the other day who hasn't spoken to his younger brother for 20 years. I met a man a few months before, he hasn't spoken to his father out of anger for more than 10 years. I know people who are angry with their family, their brother, their sister, husband and wife, children, we're angry. Prophet people were treating him so badly and yet he was always willing to forgive them. He was always willing to forgive. So, if we are going to follow the Prophet of Allah's example, remember what Ali ibn, Abi Talib, Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib described him. He was never stern, but always lenient towards people, always forgiving them, always looking for ease for them, always looking for ease for them, not difficulty. And then he said, Ali said, You never spoke harshly, nor were you accustomed to speaking loudly. You never said anything lewd or unseemly. You did not seek faults of others. And you were not stingy or miserly. Prophet ﷺ was never harsh to people. Even when the lady used to throw rubbish at him. You know that story? Every morning a lady used to throw rubbish at him. One day when she didn't throw rubbish, 
Prophet ﷺ went and looked, looked for her. Where is this woman who is throwing rubbish at me? I can't see her this morning after Fajr. He goes and finds her in her house, very unwell. He sits with her, looks after her, nurses her until she becomes better. And then she says, and who are you? I've never seen you before. <coughs> no other people care about me, the elderly woman. Nobody came to see me, I'm on my own. Who are you? Why have you come to see me? And there should be more people like you in my society, she said. When Prophet Allah <coughs> turned around and said, I'm Muhammad. She said, what? You're Muhammad? Yes, I'm Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she said in return, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. He was not harsh, my brothers and sisters. He was very, very kind, even to his enemies. <coughs> How many of you have not spoken to your children because you're angry with them? How many of you have not spoken to your brother or your sister because you're upset with them? How many of you find it difficult to be easy and kind hearted to your families? Prophet <coughs> Sallam was never accustomed to speaking very loudly. He did not need to scream and shout at people. This young boy told me a few days ago, I grew up in my home always listening to my father shouting all the time. I said to him, and how do you feel? He goes, I don't understand why my father used to shout all the time. In some communities, if you can shout, you're the boss. In fact, I can tell you about some strange behaviors within some communities father walks into the house children run miles they're terrified of their father father walks into the front room all the children leave apparently a sign of respect you should not be sitting with your father but oh, should you be sitting with a drunkard outside you can't sit with the father Prophet was never harsh never loud and yet our families feel the need to be loud and our fathers and our mothers need to feel the need to scream and shout at their children. If we are truly following the examples of our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he was never ever loud to anybody. A man came to the Prophet of Allah وسلم, and he said, and who are you? You? Like this. You? Who are you? If I was to use crude word, it would be who the hell are you? Right? In our colloquial street language. It was harsh, very rude. You know what the Prophet وسلم, said in return? I'm Muhammad ibn Abdullah. I'm Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. He did not say, my name is Hazrat, Mawlana, Allama, PhD, this. He didn't say anything. He could have said, Rahmatulil Alameen, Sayyidul Musaleen, Khatam al -Anbiya. He could have said all of this. He didn't say anything. He said, I am Muhammad. He did not even say, Nabi Allah. He didn't even say that. He said, I am Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Do you know why he said that? This man is an ordinary Bedouin from the streets. He doesn't like Muhammad the Nabi Allah. Maybe he will like Muhammad Ibn Abdullah. Maybe. So he said, I am Muhammad, son of Abdullah. Just like you, an ordinary man, son of a father, and a Bedouin like you. I am son of an Arab like you. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. I find it very difficult when I see our, some of our scholars, when they are introduced, they like 20 titles before their name. And then their introduction. Self-aggrandizement is arrogance. In fact, you shouldn't even do it. Introduction as a moderate thing is nice. Somebody's background is important. But Hazrat, Mawlana, Allama, before and then five titles afterward. His name is so long, you don't even know which is his name. Prophet Muhammad <coughs> never did this to anybody. Not to himself. Then the man said, okay, oh Muhammad, what is the message that you're talking about? What is this message that you've been preaching and causing trouble in my society? You know what the Prophet ﷺ did? He did not give a long lecture about Islam. He gave him, he read a verse of the Quran, and to read this verse, it takes eight seconds. He says, the message I am teaching my people and you is as follows. Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. That's it. Eight seconds. And the man understood every word of what Prophet said. Allah orders you to be just, to be excellent, and to be kind and compassionate. Allah tells you to stay away from fahsha, shamelessness, munkar, evil, and baghi, rebellion. Three orders and three prohibitions. So simple. And his message was very powerful. Ali ibn Abi Talib then says, 
Prophet ﷺ never said anything lewd. He never spoke rude. His language was not abusive. He did not use swear words. Whether you speak Urdu, Punjabi, Bengali, Siliti, or any other languages under the face of this earth, or English, if your language is rude, you are not loved by Allah. Allah doesn't love the tongue of those people whose words are not sweet. They are using foul language to speak. <coughs> I don't want to ask you this question. But do you swear? Don't answer me. If you do, you're in trouble. Because the true follower of Muhammad would never swear. Never swear. I remember when I was young, very young actually, four or five years old, my father set me on the side and he said to me, my son, can you make me one promise? Can you promise me? I was five, I think. I still remember it. I said, yes, dad, what promise would you like? He said, promise me that you'll never swear. He told me this when I was five. Promise me you'll never swear. I said, dad, I promise you I will never swear. I'm 48 today, now. I've never sworn in my life. Nobody can tell you on the face of this earth that they've ever had me swear, ever. My wife, all my family members, my mother, my father, my brothers, nobody. Because I know my tongue can take me to heaven or can take me to hell. For Prophet never spoke lewdly to anybody. Never spoke rubbish through his mouth. And he did not look for faults in other people. He did not go around looking for faults in other people. Like we do. <coughs> Your prayer is not right, your bed is not right, your hat is not right, your jubba is not right. You don't even look right, somebody said to me the other day. I said, Allah Akbar, how can I not look right? Allah made me, my brother. If you're complaining about my looks, complain to Allah, not me. I remember one brother was very upset with me because I wasn't wearing a hat. He came and screamed at me saying, what is your hat? No, no, no. He gave me a long lecture. Afterward, I said to him, so you don't like me without my hat? He said, yes. I said, do you like everything else about me? He goes, yes. I said, let me give you a hug. You only dislike the fact that I don't have a hat. But there is so much more about me than my hat. Do you like my face? Do you like my hands? Do you like my clothes? He didn't know what to say. Prophet did not look at faults of other people. He did not look at faults of his own wife. Aisha radiallahu anha said, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu never ever said, Oh Aisha, why not? Why this? Why this? Why not? Never complain. Never criticize me. One day Aisha was at home and another wife of Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam some food. And Aisha wasn't a very good cook. Amongst his wives, Aisha wasn't a very good cook. She was young. She didn't have much experience in cook in the kitchen, of course. She was very young. So therefore she didn't know how to cook. Another wife was much older, gave nice food. And the wife of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had good intentions. So the food came to the Prophet of, uh, uh, Prophet of Allah's house and uh, Aisha took the bowl and she threw it on the floor out of jealousy. The food went everywhere. Prophet sat down on the floor and gathered all the food and gathered the broken bowl and said nothing. Stayed quiet. Of course, Aisha wanted to get a response. Prophet ﷺ said to Aisha at one time, another time, Oh Aisha, there is a jinn inside you. No, he said, every one of us have a jinn with us. And you've got a jinn inside you. Aisha said, oh Prophet, everyone has got a jinn, including you. See, Aisha is upset. Prophet ﷺ said, yes, I have a jinn too. But my jinn has become Muslim and yours hasn't. <laughs> Look at the way Prophet ﷺ answered her beautifully without insulting her or criticizing her. Aisha said, Prophet was so beautiful in his character that when I did something wrong, I knew instantly. But Prophet was also a human being. So he said to Aisha, Aisha, I know when you're upset with me and I know when you're angry with me. Aisha said, oh, Prophet of Allah, how do you know when I'm upset or angry with you? With you? Prophet said, when you are upset with me, O oh, Aisha, you swear in the name of the Lord of Ibrahim. And when you are happy with me, you swear in the name of the Lord of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's called being a human, living a life of a human. He was absolutely kind, generous to his wife and his family. <clears throat> he did not look at faults of other people. 
and Prophet ﷺ was never stingy. If anybody came to ask for anything to the Prophet of Allah, he gave it. Even if he didn't have any food, he still asked, ah, Aisha, do we have any food at home? Yes, Ya Rasulullah, we've got a glass of milk. Give it to that person. And Aisha would say, I'm so hungry, I haven't eaten for many days. And I'm waiting with the milk so that Prophet of Allah would come home and I would share this with him. But he gave it away to somebody else who needs it more. Prophet Hassan would tie things around his stomach in order to not be succumbed by the hunger. Don't think Prophet of Allah was poor. He chose to live a life of simplicity as opposed to luxury. He chose the life of this kind instead of opulence because he chose that life. My brothers and sisters, Prophet of Allah wasn't stingy. He was very generous. Muslim community is very generous, alhamdulillah. I just want to remind you that you as Muslim community is the most generous people in this, in this country. Last Ramadan, you donated more than 150 million pounds in Ramadan only. Allahu Akbar. In one month, Muslim community is very generous. It is one good thing. Amongst our communities, the most generous people, can I just say, don't get offended, the Pakistanis. The most generous of our communities in this country are the Pakistanis. Wallahi, I've never seen such a generous people in my life. Wherever I go, I fundraise all the time. I fundraise all the time and, and you know this. They give the most. They, give, they don't even ask questions, they just give. Other communities ask questions. It's okay, you can ask me questions. But they give. I don't know how and where they get it from. Maybe the love of the Prophet of Allah, they have more. Maybe, I don't know. But they are very generous. But we're all generous because together we gave 150 million last year. In one month alone, subhanAllah. Prophet ﷺ, my brothers and sisters, if he, Ali said, if you disliked the request, you simply ignored it. And instead of refusing it outright, you'd remain silent. If somebody gave something to the Prophet or asked something from the Prophet, if he did not like the request, he would not tell the man, go away, I don't want to know. Or did not insult the person, he just stayed quite silent. In response, the other person didn't get insulted. <coughs> Ali ibn Abi Talib then goes on to say, from three things you always kept aloof, squabbling, arrogance, and dabbling in futile tasks. You didn't squabble with people, you didn't demonstrate arrogance, and you did not double in futile tasks. My brothers and my sisters, you know, arrogance is a big problem for all, a lot of us in this country, in our community. We are ignorant and arrogant together. It's a very dangerous combination. What is arrogance? Arrogance is the cloak of shaitan. Allah kicked him out of the heavens because he was arrogant. Couldn't Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu be arrogant? Of course he could have. But he was never arrogant. So humble he was, he comes to his people and he reads out the verses of the Quran that tells him Muhammad off. Abasa wa tawalla, Allah revealed the whole verse, whole surah about Prophet's behavior towards the blind man. Remember the story? A blind man came to see the Prophet of Allah and Prophet was busy with the elite of his society. He did not look at the man. He did not give him any attention. He turned his eyes away. And Allah was not happy with Prophet's uh, uh, treatment of this blind man that Allah revealed whole surahs, first section saying, Oh Muhammad, why are you not looking at this man? Do you think those elite are better than this man? And every time this blind man would come to the Masjid of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would get up and hug him and he would say, because of you, Allah put me right, Allahu Akbar. If it was another man, if it was another person, he would not say, Allah just told me off, guys, hey, look, Allah just told me off. No, of course he wouldn't. Self-deprecation wouldn't be the norm. But Prophet was so humble because he wasn't talking from himself. He was, revealed, he was only delivering a message from Allah. He was the messenger of Allah. That's why Allah says, وَمَا أُسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَلَمِينَ Oh Muhammad, we have sent you nothing but a mercy to the, the entire humanity. Brothers and sisters, Prophet ﷺ did not get involved in squabbling or arguing with people. In fact, one day he came out and he saw a group of people arguing. He forgot because of the argument and he was mediating between them the day of uh, Laylatul Qadr. He was coming out to tell people which day will be Laylatul Qadr. On the way he saw two people arguing, he stopped and he stopped them from arguing. He came and he said to the companions, Wallahi, I've forgotten which day Laylatul Qadr war is exactly. But I remember it's the last 10 days of Ramadan. And I also remember it's the odd numbered nights. Maybe in there, there is Barakah. Go and seek for it.
subhanallah. My brothers and sisters, Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam did not in, in, engage in squabbles or waste of time talking. Three things he spared others from. He, he never spoke ill of anybody, he never backbite anybody, never gossiped about anybody, he did not talk negatively about anybody, he did not malign anybody, he did not do things to destroy a person's reputation, and he did not spy on people either. He didn't. In fact, backbiting and gossiping was his most detested <coughs> act in the society. He hated it. Allah revealed in the Quran, I, do you, would, you, would you like to eat the meat of your, of your dead brother? Because God, backbiting is like this. Somebody said to me, well, backbiting, even if it is true, yes. Talking behind the brother's back, even if it is true, it is backbiting. What if it is false? That's a slander. My brothers and sisters, I get backbiting on me all the time. All the time. I don't, I don't mind. It doesn't bother me anymore. In fact, I sometimes say, please let me know who was backbiting. I'll send you gifts because the more you backbite about me, the more hasanat I get, the more, unfortunately, terrible uh, 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 bad deeds you get on your record. Don't backbite anybody. Backbiting is not worth it. I remember one brother came to me in Good Street Masjid where I used to be one of the imams. And as I was walking to do the khutbah, he came and he said to me, brother, do you have a minute? I said, yes, I have a minute. What's the matter? He goes to me, I'm, I'm going to go and have a, I have a high, heart bypass surgery today. My doctor told me I can't leave, but I told the doctor I must go. I'll be back in two hours. I came to tell you, I have been backbiting you for the last five years. Would you forgive me? I may die, I may never come back. Would you please forgive me? I said, of course I'll forgive you. May Allah forgive you too. I remember once I was leading prayers in my local mosque, a brother after, it was Asr Salah, Salaamu Alaikum on both sides, and then he walked over everybody, came, picked me up, gave me a hug and started crying. I said, why are you crying? Because I've been backbiting about you. When you backbite, the pain of backbiting stays in your heart. You know you're guilty of it. Prophet told all of us, don't backbite. Don't talk about somebody behind their back, something that will destroy their reputation, their character. You've got something to say, say it on their face. And if you've got something good to say, say it behind their backs. And don't spy on your brother. Oh, does he doesn't pray, let me go and find out why. <coughs> Spying is not allowed. Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was always smiling at all things which made other people laugh. He would express surprise if others were surprised. He always gave a space to those who were traveling and didn't have a place. He would put patiently in his own masjid a space for those who are strangers. He would help those who were in need and he would give his ears attentively to people who are speaking around, never cutting short anybody or interrupting them while they're talking. He would listen very carefully. He would not interrupt other people. If somebody is talking, he would let them finish. This is the example of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If anybody exceeded their limit, he was quite firm, but never rude. He was generous, large-hearted, and truthful. He was clement, lenient, and amiable. I said this story the other day in um, East Ham Town Hall, but I'll repeat it for those of you who are here, who are not there. Prophet Sallam was in Medina. And one of the times they were facing difficulty, financial difficulty. So Prophet ﷺ made out a call. Is there anybody who can help the Muslims by giving some loan? Muslims were very, very poor at that time. One Jewish man who was very rich came forward and said, I'll give you some money on Muhammad. He was a rabbi. I'll give you some money. Prophet ﷺ accepted the money with a condition. The rabbi said the condition is 
that you will give it back in one year. One year. Prophet Sallallahu said, no problem. Prophet did not take the money for him. He took it for the community of people in Medina. And then, after one year, just before the one year was over, the Jewish man came and went to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in a gathering, grabbed the Prophet by his collar like this, and shook it and shouted at him, Oh you, Muhammad, why haven't you paid my loan back? Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not say anything in response. He was calm and composed. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu was around. Now you can imagine what happens, right? Umar is around. So he gets up and he says, Oh Prophet of Allah, give me permission, I'll kill this man. He screams at the man, tells him off. Prophet Alaihi Wasallam said to Umar, Oh Umar, calm down. We don't behave like this. This is not how we deal with situations. Come now. There is no need to talk to this man like this. This man has come to claim his loan. Let him claim his loan. Why are you talking to him like this? But Prophet of Allah, he insulted you. So, Prophet said, looked at the man and said, yes, I took the loan for one year, but one year is not finished yet. Three more days to go. Man goes, I need my loan now. Prophet said, no problem. Come on. Take the man to the food chamber where we keep the food, grains, and give the man the grains that we owe him, and please give him extra 50 kilos because you insulted him. Now, Omar is even more upset. Prophet is telling Omar to pay for insulting this man, whereas this man insulted the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Omar takes this rabbi to his storeroom, fills up his sack with all the grains, and Omar is filling it up and he's feeling very angry and upset. He says to the man, what's the matter with you? You're a rabbi, man of God. Why did you insult my prophet like this? Why? Why do you talk to my prophet like this? The man said, oh Omar, take me to your prophet. I'll explain it in front of him. Omar al Khattab takes the man in front of the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is sitting there. The man comes and says, oh Muhammad, I insulted you before. Your companions want to know why. And you want to know why, I'm sure. I'm a Jewish rabbi. I heard that there is a prophet who has come in Mecca. And I also re-read that that prophet will come to Medina. And I read in my scripture all the signs of the prophet. And I've been checking your character and your behavior. All of the characters and behavior as described in our books, they meet. So I take them all. There is one that doesn't match. It's called forbearance. I don't know how to test you against forbearance. But as soon as the opportunity came to give you loan, I schemed a plan. I came to test you to see, do you know what forbearance means? Forbearance means even if you're provoked, you don't react. If somebody pushes you, you don't react negatively, you stay calm. Somebody is insulting you, you don't respond to them with an insult, you stay calm. You're measured, you're composed, you're proportionate, you're moderate, you're balanced. That's called uh, forbearance. And he said, I wanted to test you. And when I came and grabbed you by your collar, that was my plan. When I insulted you, that was my plan. Oh Muhammad, I can testify that Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. You are definitely the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Brothers and sisters, you want to follow the Prophet? How many times do we get provoked on a daily basis? Especially when you open the television and look at the news and insults against Muslims left, right and center, you get provoked. The response should never be reactionary. The response should never be response of anger and outrage. The response should always be moderate and balanced. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was truthful, clement, lenient, and amiable. One who saw the Prophet for the first time was overawed. One who kept his company, came to know him intimately, became attached to him like inseparable companion. So those who stayed with him, they loved him more than they loved anything on the face of this earth. Those who stayed with the Prophet, they loved him more than they loved anything on the face of this earth. And Prophet ﷺ loved them too. 
Muhammadur Rasulullah walladhina ma'ahu I think you read this verse right Muhammadur Rasulullah walladhina ma'ahu ashaddu 'ala al-kuffar ruhamau baynahum tarahum ruk'an sujjadan yabtaguna fadlan min Allah wa ridwana Allahu akbar Allah is describing Prophet Muhammad sallam, and his companions and say, he says, Muhammadur Rasulullah, Muhammad is the Prophet of Allah. وَالَّذِينَ مَا أَعْهُوا And those who are with him. أَشِدَّاوُ عَلَى الْكُفَّارِ Very firm against disbelief. رُحَمَاهُ بَيْنَهُمْ They are very compassionate with one another. Let me tell you the story of compassion. Prophet sallam, had a companion with him called uh, Hanzala. Hanzala was short, very short, dwarf-like and very ugly in conventional sense of the word. People would call him ugly. <coughs> Prophet ﷺ took Hanzala's marriage proposal to a family and said to the father, and would you please get your daughter married to a good guy that I know? The father was very excited. Alhamdulillah, Prophet of Allah has brought a proposal. He was very excited. So I asked a few more questions. And then eventually they asked the name of the who is the who is the guy? Prophet Sallam said Hanzala. They said Hanzala, oh Prophet of Allah. No, Hanzala, no, he's too ugly, too short. The mother said no, the father said no. Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Okay, no problem. He left. Their daughter came out and said, Oh my mother and my father, Allah's Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam brought a proposal for me. Yes. And he said no. Yes, we said, she, he's ugly. She said, no, I would marry the person Prophet has proposed. Please go and tell the Prophet of Allah, I'm ready and willing. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> so the marriage was arranged. They got married. Very soon after marriage, battle was called and Hanzala went out to fight. Battle of Uhud. I think if I remember correctly. No? One of the battles, I can't remember the exact battle. Hanzala went out to fight and he died. After the battle, Prophet ﷺ is taking account and telling everybody the news. Hanzala's wife is coming to the Prophet. Prophet ﷺ is now getting ready to give the bad news. She said, Oh Prophet of Allah, I know Hanzala has passed away. I don't come here because I'm upset with you. Allah has given him the darajat of a shaheed. I'm not complaining. Except, yeah, oh Prophet of Allah, Hanzala needed a bath. Hanzala needs a bath. Please prepare for his bath. Anyone who dies in the battle of Allah's cause should not be given a bath, they should be buried because they're shaheed. You should bury the shaheed as you find them. Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to the companions, prepare Hanzala's, Hanzala's bath for his funeral. Allah sends Jibreel with a message saying, O oh Prophet Muhammad, don't prepare Hanzala's bath on this earth because Allah has prepared his bath in the heavens. They loved the Prophet of Allah, they loved Allah and they followed him to the letter. So, my brothers and sisters, those who had seen the Prophet, they would never stay away from him. And they had never, ever would ever see another man like him before, during their time, or ever after. Anyone who saw him, even those non-Muslims who came to see him, those who wrote about the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after. I'll finish and I'll take questions inshaAllah. Michael Hurt. Is that the name of the guy who wrote a book about the Prophet? 100 most influential man on this earth. In that he wrote, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's name is the first. And when he was writing, he wrote, I desperately tried to find somebody who would meet my quality. The quality that is needed. Nobody met like Muhammad did. My brothers and my sisters, if you truly want to know the Prophet of Allah, actually, if you truly want to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet of Allah, we need to change our character immediately. Completely. From now on, make this intention. I'm gonna do I'm gonna do one at a time, not all of them in one go. Identify what is your weakest point. If you are an angry person, that's your problem. Deal with anger. If you lie, that's your problem. Deal with your lying. If you backbite, deal with backbiting. If you're harsh with people, deal with the harshness. 
Identify what is it that you are weak at the moment and struggling with. And look at the life of the Prophet ﷺ and follow his examples in the way you can. Prophet ﷺ was a very practical man. Very practical man. He did not say you are going to go to hell and that's where you're going to stay. He didn't do that. He looked after his companions. Even when a man, a young man came to him and said to Prophet of Allah, Oh Prophet of Allah, give me permission. I'd like to have an illicit relationship with a woman. What did he say to him? Astaghfirullah, you're going to go to hell, go away. He didn't say that. He said, if you want to have an illicit relationship with somebody, this person would be somebody's daughter. This person would be somebody's niece. This person would be somebody's wife. This person would be a female who belongs to a father, who, belo who has a family. Somebody would be insulted. Somebody's honor would be taken. Why would you want to do that? Would you like somebody to do that to your own sister, to your own mother, to your own daughter? The young man said, no, Prophet Prophet said to him, would you still want to go and do what you are asking to do? The man said, no, Prophet Allah, I'm fine. Do you see how the Prophet dealt with people? He was extraordinarily lenient. He never made Islam difficult for people. Mu'ad ibn Jabal was sent from Medina from, uh, uh, to Yemen to teach the people of Yemen about Islam. What did he say to people of what did he say to Mu'ad? Oh, Mu'ad, give them good news. Bashiru, give them good news. Asiru, make things easy for them. Don't make it difficult for them. Facilitate. Don't make it hard for them. A young boy came to me and he said to me, Imam, how many rak'ah do I pray for Jum'ah? I said to him, why? Because my Imam told me 20 rak'ah. I said, what? 20 rak'ah, Jum'ah. I said, don't worry about 20 rak'ah, it's only two. He goes, what? I said, it's two. Allah has given you an exemption on the day of Jum'ah from a Dhuhr prayer. You don't need to pray Dhuhr. You pray Jum'ah and you listen to the Imam giving a khutbah and praying two rak'ah together. Why make 20 out of it? Why make life difficult for people? Yes, you want to do extra prayers by yourself. Inshallah, go ahead. Allah accept it. We say, Ameen. But don't impose it on somebody else. I remember a sister who came to me one day and said to me, uh, in, a, in, in my work, we would pray a Dhuhr prayer, this sister never prayed. She's a Muslim girl. So other Muslims were talking behind her back. And I told them, don't talk behind her back. They said, no, she doesn't pray. I said, don't talk behind her back. She must have a reason. She came to me one day and she said to me, I know people are talking and I know it's uncomfortable. But let me tell you. I said, what's the, what, what's, what do you want to say? She goes to me, I want to pray, but I can't pray. I said, what's the problem? She goes, I suffer from a very bad foot condition. My feet swells up and gets infected if I wash it. Okay? If I wash, my feet swells up and gets infected. So I can't make wudu and I can't pray. That's what she said to me. I said to her, do you ever have showers? She goes, yes, I do. She goes, I have shower every morning. I said, so don't you wash your feet? She goes, I do. How do you wash your feet? She goes, I have a normal shower. I take towel, I wash it, I use dryer to dry it completely. I put talcum powder and I say to her, do you put a socks over it? She goes, yes. I said, so you have a shower every morning? She said, yes. I said, every morning from the time you leave home until you go home, you have your socks on? She goes, yes. I said, then from today, you don't need to wash your feet for wudu. All you do is wash other parts of your body. And when it comes to feet, just wipe over it. She goes, really? I said, yes. Just wipe over it, my dear sister. 15 years later, I met her. She goes to me, I've never missed my prayer ever. Never missed my prayer ever. Because make things easy for them. Prophet Muhammad made things easy for people. That's why he's rahmatul lil alameen. He is the mercy to the universe, not just Muslims. May Allah make us the same. Rahma for the ummah. May Allah accept our efforts. And may Allah make us people who love the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa like we should love him, inshaAllah. I'll take any questions if you have. I have first question. Yes, please, Bismillah. You have one last question. Um, it's not a question, but because we have um, some youth here, and the situation right now in our society, uh, we all are aware of uh, what exactly is happening. Uh, knife crimes and drugs-related crimes are in increase in, in our youth. And mostly, if, if you talk about London, uh, 
it's mostly uh, Muslims, you know, whose names have been uh, pulled out. So I think it's, it's, it's a good platform if, you know, you can talk uh, a little bit about uh, these uh, knife crimes and especially drugs related crimes. I don't want to tell the youth off. I'm, I'm still a youth, right? In the eyes of my elders, they still think I'm young. I remember they, they, uh, they always say, you're the young one, I'm not young anymore. But look, I don't want to blame the youth. Ibrahim Masjid is very big. Alhamdulillah. Do you have a youth center here? Yes. Where is your youth center? In the basement. In the basement. So all the fathers and the mothers, you should bring your children to this masjid and you should help them play here in a safe space. I grew up inside the masjid. I played in the masjid, I learned in the masjid, I slept in the masjid, I ate in the masjid, I did every single thing in the masjid. I remember when I was a little boy, my father would carry me to the masjid when I was young. So if our mosques can play a big role in opening up its doors and bringing the young people, giving them a space to come inside the masjid, then inshallah they would be better, far better than the streets. And my advice to the elders, don't judge those young people, please. Don't judge them. Even if they're walking into the mosque with torn jeans, even if they're walking with their trousers almost falling from, the, from, their, from their waist and their underwear are visible, don't judge them, let them be. Let them be. Let them come inside the mosque. Let them experience the love and the brotherhood and the sisterhood mosque offers. Let them enjoy the experience of sweetness in the mosque of your love, with your mercy and kindness. Let them enjoy it. Mosque, let the mosque be an open space. A man came to the Prophet of Allah's mosque and urinated in the mosque. You know the story. All the companions, the companions around started shouting at him. First, I said to the companions, let the man finish. He's urinating in the mosque. Prophet says, let him finish. Don't disturb him. After he finished, Prophet <laughs> said to the man, come and sit down next to me. The man sat down. Prophet of Allah told the companions, bring a bucket of water. We can clean it up. He said to the man, we pray, pray in this place. This is not a place to urinate. You can urinate outside if you want. The man said, oh Muhammad, you and me, we're the best people. Those ones are the bad ones. Because they shouted at you. What did the Prophet say to a man who urinated in his mosque? Nothing. He embraced him, welcomed him. So, young people, get your friends to come to the masjid. If the management is listening, I've always said this. In fact, it was this very same discussion I had with Shafqat. Shafqat was in this mosque a long time ago, in 1992, 93, I remember. I complained to him saying, why is the Imam giving Urdu khutbah? Shafqat said, and what do you want? I said, in English. He goes, you're starting next week. I said, just like that? He goes, yes. Your father took you to Islamic studies, spent all that time, seven, eight years learning about Islam. It's time to... Show us that you know what you know. Stand here and do the khutbah. And it was Shafqat who made sure that we started here. So I'm asking you first, open up, bring your children here. And children, if you're here, knife crime and gang crime and drugs, you know they're very destructive. They'll destroy you, take you away. It may look cool for a few days, but it's just one way, slippery slope to a miserable life and a miserable future. I remember when I went to a, a, a prison, uh, prison to see a group of people. And in the prison, there was one man I recognized. And he was looking down, he wouldn't look at me. He was looking down, he wouldn't look at me. After a while, I recognized him. So after, after my talk, I went to him and I said to him, why don't you look at me? He goes to me, you and I went to the same primary school. I said, what? Yeah, we went to the same primary school in Istanbul. He goes to me, my, my friend, he said, my friend, you chose the right way and I chose the wrong way. I chose gangs, I chose drugs, I chose violence, I chose knife, I chose guns. Look at where I am rotting in a prison. And look at you outside, enjoying the world and changing the world. And look at me, I'm rotting in a prison, in a hellhole. I'll never get out. So young people, that's what happens. When you have bad friends, when you go down that route, there is a hellhole on this earth called prison. You don't want to go there. You don't want to ruin your life because of a few moments of excitement that takes you away from the true focus. But parents are more responsible than the children. If you as, your, as the father and the mother, you have no control over your children, then there's something gone wrong. 
You need to find the way forward. You need to find parenting program. You need to find help and support from others. You need to sit down and talk. You need to open up. You need to really dig, dig deep down and find the solution rather than run away from it. So that's answering your question as shortly as I can. Are there any other questions from anybody else from the floor? Brother there, Bismillah. Uh, brother, we just want to know about, you know, this incident happened in Norway. Mm. Someone from the Quran and one Muslim brother jumped in and stopped him. Stopped him, I don't know if it. But in this scenario, what do you want us to look at it, this situation? Are we just stopped him? Or like you said, Prophet also never reacted to it. So what should be the response in what? these kind of far right, you know? So if there is a far right hatred attack, if, if somebody comes to attack your mosque, then of course you have to stop them. If you can stop them and save more lives, you do. That's not what I'm talking about. If somebody is burning the Quran, for example, if somebody is insulting the Prophet of Allah with their words, what should we do? Did the people of Mecca not insult the Prophet all the time? Of course they did. Allah mentions it in the Quran. They call you a kahin, they call you a majnoon, they call you a sha'ir, they call you a poet, possessed, they call you a madman, they call you all sorts of names. What did the Prophet do in return? Please tell me somebody. Did he order them to be executed? No. Did he attack them? Did Allah reveal verses to banish them to hellfire? No. Nothing. It's part of the game. This, this is what you will get because there are people who are upset. So if somebody insults your prophet, don't insult them back. Don't ever insult them back. Give them flowers with words, with your behavior. Win them over. It's difficult, I know. I know it's difficult. Wallahi, I know it's difficult. But unless you are able to control your anger, you will not win any argument ever. Did anyone see my interview with uh, Piers Morgan? I did an interview with Piers Morgan on ITV. And Piers Morgan, as you know, likes to go for the jugular to anyone who is interview interviewing. I understood his points and I answered. At the end of my debate, and at the end of my interview, he said to me, and Mr. Masrur, I agree with you entirely. How can we help you? From a man who started attacking me from the beginning, we need to find a way of getting our message across. I said to one uh, non-Muslim uh, right-wing fascist who hates Islam, I said to him, I've got a challenge for you. He said to me, what's the challenge? I said, I want you to live like a Muslim for one day. Just one day. Maybe you like it. And he did not like my challenge. Because if he understood Islam, and lived like a Muslim for one day, like a true Muslim for one day, after reading about Islam, he would find Islam very different. There is a, you know the, the Dutch filmmaker who made the film, a politician who made a mission of his life to insult Islam. He was eventually going to write a book against Islam. He sat down to research, the more he researched, the more he researched, the more he researched, he realized, oops, I've got it all wrong. And you know what he did? He said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He's going around the world in Netherlands and any other parts telling everybody Islam is not what you think it is. Islam is something different. So we have to respond in a measured way, in a matured way, and not in an angry way. When you're angry, you've lost the plot. You will win the hearts and minds of people like our beloved Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa did by remaining calm and proportionate. Just a brief answer to that question, but the answer to all questions about reaction is don't react. Don't react. Muslims should not be reactionary. We should be proactively creating positive environment. Reaction has never taken us anywhere. Any other questions from anybody else? Good. I like that. No questions. <laughs> It's important. So, how many of you have read the life of Prophet Muhammad sallam, a book on it? Put your hands up if you've read a book on the life of the Prophet sallam. Okay, very good. Excellent. More people have read. I want you to read more, not just one. There's a fantastic book by um, um, 
what's his name? Subhanallah. Um, no. Rahik al Maktoum is a reference book. It's got authentic stories of the life of the Prophet. Very good, of course, for reference. But I want a book that is engaging you, a literary book. So, huh? Road to Mecca is excellent, true. Zakaria Bashir's book, Road to Mecca. Zakaria Bashir has written three books on the life of the Prophet Road to Mecca, Sunshine at Medina, and Hijrah and its significance. Three books, read them very good. There is a particular person I'm looking for. He's also an Urdu writer. As uh, he wrote about the Prophet of uh, uh, Prophet um, who are the Urdu writers in, uh, in, in the Sirah? The most famous one. No. Nu'mani Sa'ab. Shibli 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 if you want to read, read about the Prophet as much as, as much as you can. The more you read, the more you love him. The less you read, the more emotionally you love him, but not really. What's the name? Uh, Sirat al Nabi by Shibli Nurman. But it's also been abridged now. There is a shorter version in English. So the Urdu version is six volumes, it's massive. But the English one, I was looking at it this morning on my shelf, it's much smaller. A fabulous book. There are so many. There is an English lady called Karen Armstrong. She wrote a book about the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the best books ever written by a non-Muslim about the Prophet, a lady called Karen Armstrong. Very good. So I'm recommending that you read as much as you can. Then there is a book written by our dear brother. Um, he is still alive, SubhanAllah. He wrote the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He translated the Dilal al-Quran into English. Ya Allah, see I'm getting old. Huh? No, uh, his, name, his name will come. He's an Egyptian brother. Amazing Sion. Huh? No, not that one. The Haikal has passed away a long time ago. Huh? Yeah, I know. But this one I'm referring to is a contemporary, somebody who's around at the, at the moment. Very good. All I'm saying to you is read more books. That's what I'm saying. Okay? It's very important to read. The life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And secondly, secondly, please, please. Forgive me if I am sounding, uh, if somebody gets offended, I'm asking you to forgive me first. Prophet Sallallahu would not, would not approve any mumbo jumbo in his name in celebration. He would not approve it. You know it already. He would not approve any mumbo jumbo. He would not approve processions, cake cutting, or all sorts of nonsense. Never. He didn't do them. His companions never did them. Sahabas never did them, Tabi'in never did them, Tab Tabi'in never did them. Why do we do them? You can't become closer to Prophet of Allah. Did, uh, did Umar al Khattab love Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Did Al Waqqal love Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Did Ali love Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Uthman love Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Sallam? They did. They didn't do any of this nonsense. So the best way to celebrate the life of the Prophet is follow his life. In your life, through your character. Through your character. And character isn't manifested in your beard and your turban. If you want to wear a beard and a turban, it's your choice. But it's not manifested. I know many people who have wonderful beard and wonderful turban, but terrible to their wife when they go home. That's not Muhammad Wasallam's character. So, we need to follow his character. And part of his character is to be good to all his fellow human beings essentially Muslims and non-Muslims may Allah make us the best inshallah please say ameen may Allah forgive us and enable us so that we can do better inshallah I'm going to stop because there are no questions and I think there's going to be food and there's going to be other conversations with one another may Allah bless you all and I'm going to say please make dua for me inshallah and we make dua for one another uh, that Allah makes us stronger and more powerful together